And uh, I would first of all like to say welcome, Zero Project family. And we truly are a family with over 3,400 participants all committed to disability inclusion and the world without barriers. Uh, we're really delighted to be on day three of our multi-day conference simultaneous on three channels with over 90 hours of content. But of course, that does not happen in and of itself. It only happens with dedicated partner organizations, with trusted partner organizations, which we are so thankful to have on board and so thankful to have with us and create these really novel and interesting partner channel sessions. And uh, Francis West uh, really, I think, needs no introduction. Her experience uh, speaks for itself, and we're so thankful to her that she's convened the, this great parking channel session. So all I can say is a really warm thank you from the entire team. Thank you, Francis, for putting this together. We, we really appreciate it. And uh, thank you, and you begin to say how appreciative we are of all your efforts. And with that being said, I would like to hand over and wish you all a wonderful parking channel session. Well, thank you very much uh, for the Zero Projects. A warm welcome. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, also, a shout out to Chinese uh, New Year fans. So we just entered uh, the year of Ox. So this is a really a great day. Uh, my name is Francis West, and I'm the founder of Francis West Co. We are a, a strategy, um, global strategy advisory company working with uh, businesses, governments, nonprofit, and startup. Um, to innovate around an organization um, framework that to operationalize inclusion so that uh, we can um, holistically, systematically, and most importantly, authentically uh, implement digital inclusion. I'm delighted to have the panel um, of experts uh, to join me uh, to talk about up and, and reskill through technology, regardless of age and ability. And on the panel, we have Stella Lubeshort, CEO of a Reframework. We also have Josh Miller, CEO of Three Play Media, and uh, Troy Otilio, of CEO of Ira. Last but not the least, and Nicola Palmerini, uh, Director of National Innovation Center of Aging, Newcastle University, based in UK. We will have another a panelist joining us. Um, Allison O'Brien, who's the senior VP of AARP and of research, and also she's the enterprise lead of technology and digital equity of AARP or uh, Association or American Association of Retired People. Um, this is a, a dream team as far as I'm concerned. Um, all of them uh, have tremendous uh, background and knowledge in both the disability and the aging. Uh, I'm going to start the panel by asking Stella, ladies first, um, to pay, perhaps share her perspective uh, based on her uh, business background and also now en as entrepreneur and also as a professor at NYU. How do you look at this topic of, um, of a technology intersection with aging and, uh, and ability and specifically maybe speak uh, this, its impact on, on women uh, at large? Thank you so much, Francis, for uh, inviting us to be part of this. And thank you, Zero Project, for driving the change that will benefit all of us, regardless of the age. This is such an important topic. I'll start with a little bit of introduction. I am a technologist by education. I am a consultant by trade. And the calling that I have is human resources. I spent most of my career in HR, and I have seen the opportunities for HR to influence how uh, all of us in the workplace are treated, are included, are developed, created opportunities for growth, et cetera. My mission is to humanize the workplace and I do it in several ways. I work with the conference board, which is a think tank um, that uh, produces research events, uh, uh, um, different uh, gatherings and um, tracks, economic and uh, uh, organizational indicators. I also consult and my area of expertise is really about using human-centered design thinking in the context of the workplace and using technology and people analytics uh, to inform 
areas of uh, greatest impact. I also teach the same at NYU. I teach a class on digital workplace design. I'm a true believer that uh, HR is at the precipice of a new revolution where we are starting to see that human centricity coming to the world of the uh, employees and um, the focus on creating a better experience for us. And obviously technology plays a huge role and uh, the, um, the opportunities for uh, creating an inclusive workplace are exponentially growing, especially now when everybody started accepting the fact that we can work remotely, we can work in a distributed way, and um, we don't necessarily have to necessarily be five days a week in the office. The area of my biggest satisfaction and biggest impact and pride is Amazing Community, which is a nonprofit organization that I co-founded with Nick uh, several years ago. Uh, our mission is to expand the work horizon for women. And at the core is really creating a community of women 45 and over who are navigating the present and future of work together in this digital world. We all uh, see the opportunities and disruptions that are being brought about by technology, but we all believe that everyone has superpowers and everyone has the ability to transfer their skills and strengths into this new world. So back to your question, um, uh, Francis, when you think about the age technology and the intersection of those, I, I have a point of view from a chart perspective, right? I do believe that a lot of the technology we have, um, it is claimed that it's too difficult and people cannot learn it fast enough, therefore we need to invest significantly in upskilling. But I would like to challenge the point of view if you think about the technology revolution that was brought about by all the Apple products, a lot of the upskilling needs were eliminated just by the virtue of really accessible and user-friendly design. So I believe a lot of the technology inside the organization that we expect people to know may be improved and the uh, opportunities for people to use them by just designing it differently, designing it with um, uh, was more accessible principles using universal design and making it intuitive and easy to navigate as opposed to expecting people to learn it all. Um, there is also an interesting dynamics that I noticed in the conversations with members of the amazing community. There are general differences and expectations. We have a lot of uh, younger generations that are saying, this is really poor design, therefore it needs to be changed and um, needs to be improved, as opposed to older generations that are saying, actually it's me who I don't know technology, therefore I'm gonna self-select. So I think there is also a, a narrative that needs to be changed in terms of the acceptance and, and um, demand our, uh, uh, um, better usability for, for us to be able to use that technology. When it comes to women, I think while women is just a sub, subset of the population, it's a large subset. And if we think about the participation rate of women, especially now in the mid pandemic time, when uh, many of us had to balance uh, childcare responsibility, had to balance uh, home uh, homeschooling in addition to their work responsibility, all of this created a lot of tension and many women are stepping out of the workforce and it will create even a bigger challenge and gap from pay equity, from ability to return back into the workforce. That was one of the reasons why the amazing community in the first place was started. And I believe technology is a really great conduit to enable women to continue to stay in the workforce because that gives them the flexibility. It requires a little bit of a different thinking from uh, a workforce, uh, workplace design perspective. It requires different policies, um, but it is enabling women to participate and continue to stay engaged and, and um, uh, have not only a source of financial um, income, but also have the ability to build that network and continue to uh, stay connected to the business world. Um, the other, uh, the final thought I have on this is we, we hear a lot that everybody needs to learn how to code, everybody needs to get deep into the um, technical skill, but I do believe that women also have a very um, incredible superpower, which is more of a soft skill, bringing that uh, collaboration, bringing that um, 
uh, ability to bring teams together to resolve conflicts that will uh, uh, create a very different dynamics in the workplace. And uh, the more we can provide opportunities for women to stay, as well as um, uh, continue to thrive in the workforce, everybody will benefit, including the organizations. Well, great, thank you. Yeah, I mean, your last point about the soft skills, I mean, I was just reading a uh, report by World Economic Forum and uh, that the skills that's going to be required because of, because of uh, technology automation in the future, in, in many cases, are, for example, the creative skill, project management skill, which tends to be, in, some, uh, in many cases, the kind of a forte of women. Um, so with that, uh, I, want to, uh, I want to switch uh, over to, uh, to Allison, who just joined us. Uh, and uh, you know, if, you, if you look at McKinsey, actually recently did a report and it said one third of workers will have to switch occupation by 2030 due to automation. And this is a huge number of, um, of change or reskilling and upskilling that's going to be required. And Estella, you mentioned the pandemic impact you know, on all of us. So, um, Allison, you are the you are the um, the head of the uh, AARP, uh, which have massive members. I think thirty or forty million members, and uh, would love to hear from your perspective on what are some of the trends that you're seeing and how technology impact you know uh, the future of work uh, in terms of skill um, you know acquisition or retention stem um, uh, perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and apologize for being late. Talk about women and technology in the workplace. It was not working for me uh, this morning, but glad to be on with you folks. Um, so yeah, so I think, so AARP, as you mentioned, um, Francis has, we have 38 million members in the US, so we're actually the largest member organization, um, which also I think speaks a lot to um, the power of older adults. So I'm gonna come at this with the sort of intersection of age and ability. That's the frame that I tend to look at this. Um, so let me just set the stage a little bit, right? So if we're looking at older adults in the workplace, right now, about a third of the US workforce is 50 plus and you know again I would say the US is sort of in the mid-range there if you look globally um, for that but what's interesting is that people 65 plus are actually the fastest growing sector of the workforce in the US um, and the uh, it was projected the Bureau of Labor Statistics said that from 2014 to 2024 sort of in the middle there right now the US was projected to grow for those people who are 55 plus, uh, see 55 to 64 in the workforce, they're projected to grow an incredible amount, right? Like I think it's 55%. And if you're talking, or 55% for the 65 plus, if you're talking about 75 plus, 86% growth over a 10 year period for the 75 plus. Now they are smaller numbers, but that's a huge amount of growth, right? And, and a lot of other countries are already there. In the UK, you've got two thirds of um, the 55 to 64 age range and in Japan, it's three quarters of them are in the workforce. In some countries like New Zealand and Sweden, it's 80% um, of those older adults are in the workforce. So this is a really big group of, of, um, of our workforce that we're talking about. So that's the reason why I think this conversation around sort of this intersection of age and ability is going to be really critical. Um, I think the other piece that's important for us to keep in mind is that, you know, this is not just um, either a human rights issue or a, a CSR, a doing good kind of issue. This is an economic issue, right? Workplaces that are diverse, and in particular, when we've looked at age diversity in the workforce, are more profitable, right? So we're not just talking about doing this because it's a nice thing to do. We're doing it because it's actually the economically correct thing to do. You know, and, and I think another side note, I know we're talking mostly about the workplace here, but I think if we're thinking about economics overall and the, and the implications that changes in the workplace, and particularly around ICTs and, and, and older adults, you know, things that happen in the workplace often trickle down, right? They sort of trickle out to, to uh, society and culture, especially from a technological perspective. And I think what's interesting there is if you look a little bit broader, you see that, um, you know, you're looking at entrepreneurs, for example, and startups. Right now in the US, over a quarter of new enterprises are started by adults that are 55 to 64. Right? There's a lot of these stereotypes that we think of, you know, it's all the young folks and they're all running in and this is tech startups too. They're also being started by older adults. And then if you look at unpaid labor, 
right? You look at caregiving, you look at volunteering, then you're talking about driving huge sectors of the economy and older adults are the ones who are spending most of the time. So I think those are all reasons why it's important. I think, you know, you were referencing the pandemic, um, of course, because how do you not do anything right now and not reference the pandemic? And I think what we're seeing is that older adults have certainly been the hardest hit. Um, they have been much more likely to be let go. I think 17% more likely to be let go. Um, and they're the last ones to get rehired. Um, and a lot of what's going on there is actually, and I can talk about this a little bit later, later is really tied to ageist perspectives of the technology issues with older adults, right? So those organizations, particularly white collar, have gone more digital um, and more virtual. A lot of um, a lot of ageist, you know, issues or not a recognition that they need to address the diversity and age and skill when it comes to technology, right? An assumption that it'll just happen. Um, and I think the last place, and I just wanted to sort of highlight again what, um, and, and maybe reinforce what Stella was saying, which you know, I'm talking here about age. If you overlay gender and if you overlay race in the US, then we're talking about even more critical issues that we have to address. And so again, you know, we're looking at this, I think in a really multifaceted way, which I like. Um, so you take age, ability, gender and race, and then we're really dealing with issues that, that we're gonna have to address if we're going to have um, an equitable workforce and a, and a successful workforce. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree with you more that I know you are like a proponent of the double, uh, double bottom line, you know, I mean, we are talking about this is really not just them, it's about all of us, because at one point in time, we're either situationally disabled or you're like me over a certain age, I'm not gonna share, but you're gonna start acquiring, you know, like uh, a vision impairment in the form of uh, bifocal uh, glasses needed. So this is really, a, like you said, a societal topic. And I think that's why this topic is so interesting with the aging demographic as a global trend. Um, it really fuels a lot of uh, opportunities. And I like uh, Stella mentioned that I think the younger generation actually has a much healthier perspective about this whole ability and aging, and then not just a perspective, but they actually jump in to do something about it. So with that, I actually want to uh, introduce Josh because Josh, you you really are one of those people that you started you know, looking at the space and innovating around this when you were in college or you in, in grad school, right? So could you just share your, a bit of your personal journey and how you become an entrepreneur and now actually has a very successful and vibrant company that's provide solution for age and abilities? Yeah, uh, thank you, Francis, and, and thanks to the Zero Project. I mean, this is, uh, I could have sat back and just listened to Stella and Allison for a while. Uh, it's just, it's fun to be a part of, so, so thank you for that. Um, so at 3Play Media, we're focused on making video content accessible. And so it's everything from transcription, closed captioning, subtitling, audio description, really trying to address all facets of being able to consume content in the kind of non-obvious ways, if you will. So, you know, the, a lot of people think about uh, deaf and hard of hearing communities or blind and low vision communities. I think one of the most exciting things that we're seeing today, which is what we actually really tried to push uh, on day one to Francis's point when we started, is the idea that this is, this is something that enables people to consume content no matter what ability or disability they may have. Um, and that you know, people learn differently, people consume differently. If you're 18, you have three devices going at the same time. And you know, this is just, this is the new reality we're in. And of course the pandemic. So you know, when we started the company, we were you know, you know, kind of trailing off this idea of you know, YouTube, this whole new thing of YouTube get, getting off the ground and like, hey, this, this, this video thing seems to be real what else can you do with it, right? And, and we happen to have conversations with a few organizations going that needed to make their content accessible. What got us really excited wasn't about just building uh, a new captioning or transcription army. It was about how do we take what is, a, what is currently considered an accessibility solution and how do we make it about adding value to video? Um, and that was one of the things that got us excited and wanting to pursue it in the first place. And, and all, you know, fair disclosure is it took a while, right? The, the reality is that the first um, step was to pe for people to understand what does it even mean to make content accessible? Why? Why do we have to do this? And I think that, you know, the good news is, you know, over the last few years, people 
do understand it better. Um, and it's becoming more pervasive in the sense that it's more of a table stake to have closed captions on your video. That's a, that's a great thing. You know, I had a conversation with a bunch of people in the media industry recently about this. And it was really interesting to think about how you know, video or film producers, they do it for the love of creating content. And they put it out there for people to consume their story. They're, they're storytellers, essentially, visual storytellers. So why would they ever think about not getting it in front of somebody, right? You know, the, the whole idea is to get it in front of someone. Same thing with an educator, a professor, a teacher. They're doing it because they love to instruct. They love to teach. And so the same idea, if you can help them and you know, enable them to, to teach more effectively uh, is, is such a big deal. And I think something that Stella touched on is really important. The idea that simplifying and you know, focusing that user experience, something that Apple mastered is very, very real. Uh, and so I'll steal a quote or borrow a quote from uh, Derek Featherstone who, who uh, works at Little Access. He said that today's accessibility challenge or today's accessibility requirement is tomorrow's usability standard. And I think one of the things that's so fascinating about accessibility and inclusion is that what we really do view as a challenge to solve a problem, we start to find ways to make it actually be kind of the normal experience for everyone. And, and we like to point to things like curb cuts in the sidewalk or sliding doors that are all automated. Those were originally designed to accommodate an accessibility requirement. But can you imagine going through life today without those? No, absolutely not. Um, and so, you know, we think same thing for video. Uh, when we think about, especially now that we're all remote, you think about all the people, whether it be your workforce, whether it be your school, um, people learn differently. And I think that's something that we have to take very, very seriously, that some people are visual learners, some people like to read, uh, to consume it. And it's almost funny how you, you look back to the classroom experience, you're essentially limiting um, to one mode. Um, and you know, we've accepted that and we've made it work, um, but it might not be optimal. Um, and so we, especially when you think about your employee base and, and others, we have an opportunity here to use technology to actually make things more flexible. And it doesn't take that much effort if you put the, the thought in in advance. It's, it's, much more, it's much harder to retrofit. Um, but when you think about it and you take a step back and say, what are the tools that we wanna put in place to build out a really, uh, really impressive and really engaging learning experience, you know, the tools are there. Um, it's just a matter of taking a little bit of extra time to, to learn about what it needs to be and how it needs to, to be put together. And this, this whole idea of universal design uh, that we like to talk a lot about as well, that you know, how can we enable content consumption and learning experiences that can really be done by anybody anywhere um, with any kind of ability. Um, and, and it becomes very powerful because I think what we will see um, is that when a course or any kind of training is, is developed in a way with learning, you know, with universal design, you're going to start to see the people who don't necessarily need it on paper perform better. They're going to be more engaged. They're going to retain that content much more effectively, and it will provide positive ROI. It will actually um, have an effect on the bottom line because your employees have learned more efficiently. Um, so that's one of the things we, we try to measure. We've actually done a few studies ourselves with some universities about the effect of having text alongside your video and being able to search through your video, um, which is a very easy thing to do if you think about it um, in, in, the, in the beginning of, of publishing your content. Um, so it, it, you know, this is a really, really interesting topic. And I, you know, obviously with the, with the pandemic, we were, everyone was forced to figure something out really, really quickly. Um, and, and that makes things hard, right? Because now you're forced to kind of go back, you know, are we redesigning, are we retrofitting, what are we doing? Um, but, it, you know, this, this is a, it, we're in a really interesting position to kind of force ourselves to, to think through these things. So Josh, uh, thank you. I mean, you just actually uh, touched upon uh, like a two points. Uh, some of you know that I wrote a book, uh, Authentic Inclusion Drives Destructive Innovation, but this accessibility to me from day one is not about meeting compliance. From day one, I thought of it as extreme personalization. And so that's really a, a kind of a concept. I think we all, we now all, you know, kind of uh, can, can, and, and can understand and rally around it. And another is technology made human, right? I mean, Stella and, and Allison, you all mentioned that, you know, I think the technology has moved far enough that we really, the, the technology should 
augment the uh, human, not the not the other way around, right? So, so with that, uh, I want to introduce uh, Troy uh, Otilio. Uh, he's the CEO of uh, uh, IRA, and I actually have the uh, privilege of watching the the kind of a revolution, uh, evolution. Maybe it's revolution too of IRA as a company. And uh, from day one, um, talking about design in um, the the executive team at IRA has involved the people with disability in their, even at the conceptual stage. So talk about, you know, nothing about us without us, you know, they really not just took the idea, but implemented in a startup construct. And now is a, is a, is a really a, a good example of how it, you know, it benefit has a uh, benefit of the, not just the uh, user society, but business wise. So Troy, could you, uh, uh, share some of your uh, perspective and, and also the IRA journey in the context of uh, upskilling and reskilling. Because I know you guys have done a lot of work, especially during the pandemic. Yeah, sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Troy Tilio. I'm the CEO of IRA. It's uh, everyone goes, well, what's what's IRA? What's the name? It stands for Artificial Intelligence Remote Assistance. It's a really fancy name. Um, our mission is to really elevate independence, really for everyone. But today we focus on people who are blind or visually impaired. And I do want to share some context. There's so many ways this topic intersects with what we do. And I hope by sharing some of the insights that we've seen, it can either inspire you to think about doing things differently or, um, or, or how we approach, you know, including this, this pandemic. Like, you know, I think about this conference, the, uh, what was the, what, one of the missions or one of the ideas is without barriers, which, um, kind of relates to, I don't know if you can see my uh, background here, there's a hashtag above me on the, I guess that's the left-hand side. It's what our users kind of came up with on their own and I'll describe who they are, but it's on my own terms. And um, so what is IRA? Um, IRA is about a five-year-old startup, as, as Francis mentioned, it, we started with the idea that could, could we do something with technology to provide more independence to people who are blind and visually impaired? And I think it started with like, at our roots, we we're very curious and we wanted to listen. So um, what we were told by this uh, audience of people who are blind and visually impaired is that there's a lot of great attempts to produce solutions, but you know, you really need to listen and embrace the community. And so maybe that's like the first lesson that we learned that made us, you know, successful today, which is you need to engage people um, and listen and listen very deeply before you jump to conclusions about what the solution is. Um, and so let me let me describe a little bit about what IRA is and how it works, because um, I think it'll provide the context. So the idea is that as someone who's blind or visually impaired, you need access to visual information. Uh, Josh was talking about that in the terms of, you know, descriptions of video. And um, with IRA, what we have is a mobile app that you download and you can use it for free. And if you press the button here, you're connected to a live remote agent who is professionally trained and works with people who are blind, visually impaired every day to take on almost any task. And while we started and we thought that the task to solve was navigation, it only represents 20% of our calls. In fact, over the pandemic as a shift, we talk about like the shifts that have taken place. We saw navigation drop as you'd expect if people aren't going out and about and move from a we, we had about 20% of our calls were online. So this is where someone's trying to get something done, whether it's uh, school or work or personal. And, um, and you should know 40% of websites are inaccessible. And what I mean by that is there's some element on that website that will prevent someone from being successful at their task. And if you look at the pandemic, just as an example, this rapid shift meant that a lot of people were thrown into new digital environments that they did not have the training and they weren't even in the office to rely on other folks um, for help. And so what that looked like is you're trying to keep up. Uh, like, I don't know, like how many of us had to lear learn Zoom this year? How many are still having to remember to hit the unmute button? How many times do you get lost? And that's just one tool. And, you know, for, for us who are, you know, have all of our capabilities, it, it, it can be even more interesting or more challenging if, if, you know, you don't have access to that visual information. But with a press of the button, you're connected to a live agent who's working remote. And there's actually a story here, Francis, that I didn't think about when we were talking before. The agents themselves, um, a couple things, we, we just did our annual survey with our agents. They work from home. Um, for many of them, this is a part-time job, but 
60%, 65% of our agents are women. And you talk about like trying to adapt uh, to both remote and kind of this shift to like the, even parenting, like the need to be at home. IRA is a great opportunity because it doesn't require that you go into the office. We were designed virtual to start. And then we actually employ a lot of people with different abilities, disabilities. I'm obviously this is a job that if, if, um, if you're mobility impaired, this is a great job. So if you think about the solution of connecting people who are blind or visually impaired today to these remote agents, this is a great example where a little bit of innovation and a lot of hard work has paid off to ba basically benefit both sides. And we did start as a consumer play, like in other words, um, whether it's free or a paid plan, which gives you more access to agents. Um, we quickly learned that businesses had a desire, organizations, government organizations had a desire to deliver this as either an accommodation or a just a benefit to their customers. And in this last year, we've seen a, a massive uptake in both universities who are again, trying to deliver remote learning, yet the, the constituents they serve, especially people who are blind or vision impaired, don't have access to the campus, or if they do, it's challenging to social distance. Um, and so they, they've, uh, some of like OSU and Princeton and Texas A&M and about 40 different universities have chosen to reach out to IRA and deploy the service. But I think what's more exciting is um, I do think we're in a bit of a renaissance in the way corporations are approaching diversity and inclusion, which is, I think, awesome, which, you know, we think about necessity as the mother of invention. I think the pandemic for all the havoc it's, it's wrought and is still uh, creating, it has shifted people's mindsets. Like they can't do things the way they've done it before. They're, they're new. There's new inspiration here. And I think it's, it's, our job to take up, you know, make the most of this opportunity. And so I'm talking about companies who are now deploying IRA for the benefit of their employees. So, you know, these are companies, uh, you know, marquee companies uh, like, like Amazon or McDonald's or insurance companies. And, you know, it's, we're so new and we're so young that, you know, this is not even a service that's been heard of. And so I think the next thing I think about that we're learning, and I'm here to like, just um, share is that, you know, there are innovative solutions out there that maybe haven't been discovered before, but in this time of need, this is the time to rapidly shift. And so I, I, would, I would close with at least this part that, um, yeah, there is, a, there, there is a need obviously to upskill, you know, and, and to train. And um, at IRA, like we have just such a unique situation because of the nature of our product that is this live video, this audio that's going back and forth, you know, I have this, you know, unprecedented view of really what's going on in the daily lives, in this case, of people who are blind or vision impaired. And what I can say is that, you know, as humans, as, as the, you know, as, as uh, all of us, everyone is adapting rapidly. And I think it's our, our job to find out what are the solutions that can make that happen more quickly, more easily. And I'm just, very honored to be at IRO at this time because I think we're providing a great value that had it not been here, you know, that the outcome would not have been as good. Well, Troy, thank you for um, um, sharing, especially the kind of use case that's really, you know, today, here and now, uh, from how your solution, you know, was able to impact the, the um, your users. And I always I always, when I first heard about IRA, I always liked the fact that, you know, you, you get a double gain. I mean, on one hand, you got a user using the technology can go about doing their uh, work or, or navigate and whatever. On the other side, your, you know, kind of your agent model, it's like the Uber or Lyft mm -hmm. model of the future. It's a gig economy, very flexible, can sign in and sign out, and it's highly adaptive to the new work norm, especially mm -hmm. like Stella mentioned for women, who may not, who may choose to be at home to uh, care for the uh, children's education and whatever, because these are critical uh, tasks. And another point you mentioned is like, I think pandemic really brought up this, uh, my favorite book during the pandemic is actually going back to the, to read the little prince, you know, what's invisible is actually essential. So, um, so this whole idea of that, you know, we, we uh, especially enterprise, you mentioned, the renaissance, the company R seems to be coming around and understanding that there is that social purpose and social responsibility. If the executives don't come to grip with it, 
the actually the employees, you know, will force them to, especially the young Gen Zers or millennials are pushing for more of a social justice uh, uh, mm -hmm. kind of uh, authentic uh, engagement. So with that, I want to, um, you know, I mean, we kind of all talked about from different perspective and uh, Nicola, you are in academia um, now and you were in IBM research, you know, so from, from the, um, from academia standpoint, what are some of the, you know, kind of a broad trend that you're seeing uh, that's happening that's positive on the reskilling and also upskilling through technology? And, and what are some of the missing uh, um, link that is still yet to be addressed either at the policy level or the technology lo uh, level? We'd love to hear on your perspective. Thank you, Francis, and thank you for, for having put together this beautiful panel and thanks to the Zero Project. I think it's a great initiative. Yeah, um, yes, I am in a sort of a hybrid situation here. Um, we are uh, the National Innovation Center for Aging, and let me underline the word innovation. It's something that I think we're all bringing at the table, and for us is a core component. UK government has stated one of the, I think, most uh, intelligent, in my opinion, initiative to sustain one of the things that which is happening to this country at globally, as Alison said before, it's obviously aging. And the, the UK government decided to launch what four grand challenges. And four grand challenges are 7.5 billion pounds on research investment on four main streams, artificial intelligence, self-driving vehicles, uh, climate change and aging which I think it gives you the perspective that uh, you need a political ecosystem to allow innovation to happen. And uh, the challenge also has a pretty ambitious target, uh, add five years of healthy life to UK citizens by 2035, which as you see, it's not only putting in a budget and sustain innovation, but also give a target on how research and innovation can help living uh, people for longer. At the center, we have the mission to join and make the bridge between what evidence and research can help and bring to the market, not necessarily only on the healthcare space, which is, let me say, the most obvious first industry that we look at when we think about living longer. There's a, all the, uh, the plethora of industries around us that really needs innovation and can fuel innovation if we're able to infuse the, as Troy, I think, well-shaped before in terms of logic uh, in the daily life of organization and all our businesses. I think that if we're able to transform um, the need of an aging population, in my case, because we care mainly about the older adults, uh, in the daily life of, of the corporations and, and the businesses, that's where we think we can make the, the game to change because there's a lot of things happening around inequalities related to an aging population. And you can really touch and feel it around, for example, the Northeast of England, which is very different from the South of England. And we are based in the North. And the fact we're in the North, I guess, also gives us the perspective of one of the faces areas of the UK getting older, where we can practically try to develop new businesses and new business models, as Troy suggested, that can help to speed. The point is that there is no return on society if we are not able to uh, fuel the economic change. So the strategy that we have put in place is physically business strategy that it's engaging the, the academia and bringing the research and innovation to the market. We call it aging intelligence. We, we trade market it. And I think underline the fact that, that what we think it's missing is a layer of intelligence. Let me explain. There are two intelligence out there that are happening today. There's an intelligence of all the innovations. Troy, Josh just showed a couple of examples of the many ideas out there. The typical, we tend to reinvent. So <laughs> they're already out there. The point is that nobody knows they're there. Well, Troy, Josh, you are famous. But what I'm saying is that there's a lot of good ideas that we should be able to leverage and that's a layer of intelligence that we have to bring to the table. And then there is the intelligence of people. So typically, as, as we retire, then Alison again can tell us a lot about it. We just put in a frame, we just put in a corner, and that intelligence is lost. And that intelligence is the one that we have to bring back, not because it's nice to do it, because it's fun, because it, it's uh, literally empathic to do it, but because we need that intelligence to help all the other people that needs that piece of intelligence to bring to be back 
uh, brought back to the to the market. So what, I, what I'm trying to say is that what the work we are doing here, just leveraging, we have a community not as big as ARP in terms of numbers, but we have a community, 8,000 people that we involve in the processes we do. So everything we do is co-designed with the community here. I would like you to just join me here in my office downstairs. We have designed the Forge and Kitchen. It's a real kitchen that has been designed with in mind go the, through the generations. So you literally can buy a kitchen when you're in your 20s. And then thanks to the upgrade of the technology embedded in the kitchen, the kitchen changes shapes and has been designed together with a different generation, which I guess it's another key element of the discussion. If we don't bring an intergenerational narrative to the play, I think we're literally losing the opportunity to make the bridge and see this is not a matter of age. It's a matter of sharing this knowledge and intelligence and bring it back to the stage. Uh, we have a methodology, we call it uh, aging in translation, which literally is trying to translate the needs and the research in something which is practical. We have done a fantastic job with some small startups, but also bringing bigger entities to the table. And I think that the key, as Troy said, is that if we find a way to embed what we have defined as the return on society, so you have a ROI, a return on investment, but how we can measure and show the return on society whenever you do a project. And one of the most powerful ways to do it is just to literally infuse the innovation within the organization. I always tend to say that we are, let me say, pretty good with diversity. We're not that good with inclusion. The example is it's you can invite people diverse to play the match, but then if you keep on on the bench, you're not including them. And Francis, I know I'm opening your door here <laughs> because you taught me a lot about what I'm saying here. But the point is that if we're able to bring that inclusion inside, I think we can really make the change. Finally, from the academic perspective, our community is telling us we want the opportunity, but the opportunity are not there. So even very basic technology that can help us to match the opportunities. I know Francis is another place where you go uh, usually. It's where I think we can really make the change. So there is a lot of in initiatives. We have a couple with Stella, for example, in trying to bring a marketplace where people can bring their expertise clearly to organization that can take advantage of it. It's something that we can do. There's a lot that technology can do to create this match. Artificial intelligence is properly used, ethically used, can really be the accelerator to this game changer. And there's a lot of small or bigger initiative that academia can fuel and empower. The campus that we are trying to create is the intergenerational campus where people can apply not only for bird watching, which is the classic you know, third age university, but also to artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, astronautics, if you want to do it in your 70s or 80s, why not? That's where we have to suggest on how we can make this change happen. And academia, I guess, has the core um, uh, opportunity, because it's an opportunity, obviously, but also the, the core mission to try to merge this uh, narrative in order to show that you can learn over time and it's going to happen since we're living longer, as I think Alison will suggest later. Thank you. I mean, I can't believe it. We actually only have like 13 minutes left. <laughs> so I knew this was going to happen. We need to have like another session, another hour or two to talk about this. One of the, I'm just going to throw one open question out. And, and, and uh, I mean, to me, all of us, you know, are talking about, I mean, all, not just talking, but uh, 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 executing on, uh, on innovation. And I think the, the difference is that all of you have a, a capability or um, through your organization to scale the innovation. And uh, so uh, maybe each one, uh, whoever wants to take a, take a shot at it, like how important it is that you can, we can address this skill and a skill issue, reskilling or upskilling at scale through technology. And if you have one or two examples in your work or in your um, you know, initiative that can demonstrate that the scalability, because we know this is a global topic, right? This is not the United States. And Allison, you share some of the beautiful statistics. So any examples, uh, any takeaway that for uh, policymakers or for big business who really want to do a scale um, um, impact on this uh, learning and the skilling uh, at scale. 
I can take this quickly. Um, I think I, I love, I'm going to steal this skilling at scale because it's such a catchy uh, combination. Um, the beautiful part that we've discovered through work uh, at Amazing Community is if you use technology, you are able, of course, to uh, much faster expand your reach, geographically speaking, and engage a lot more people. And with ability to use Zoom and breakout rooms and recorded, pre-recorded sessions and then um, offline exercises, it allows people to learn at their own pace with their own schedule uh, constraints and then create uh, and, and then the second co critical component is a cohort, a cohort that you are studying with because that becomes your accountability uh, bodies and they, uh, they help support your journey. So I think those two components are, uh, are definitely an enabler for us at Amazing Community to scale fast some of our offerings. If I may uh, tell one story, Francis, is about uh, how we use AI in, a, in, a, in my opinion, smart way they could scale. Um, we developed a tool which called it uh, the ex exclusion spotter, which is a machine learning tool that is basically analyzing the job posting online and suggesting to recruiters how they can change the language based on how much age is missed in the language. When you typically search for, you know, dynamic, fast, reliable, blah, 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 all those words are associated naturally to a perception of age, even if age is not written there. So you just immediately exclude people to think that they are not part or allowed to apply for the job because the language is literally pulling them out. So if you can help uh, organization to how rewrite, for example, in a more proper way, in a more inclusive way, we are, you're already doing something and they're using the technology which is very powerful and could have a lot of bad application or good application if you understand how to leverage it properly. The second example, we worked here with a company called OnHand, which has developed, uh, let me say, matching between uh, people in, who need cares and volunteers, which is, let me say, something quite traditional because it's a matchmaking. But if you use it at the industrial standard, so with a mobile logic first application, uh, losing, uh, sorry, using and developing dashboards that allow you to see who needs what, where, when, you start creating through data, something that is pretty normal and natural, but using and leveraging the capabilities we have today that technology allow us and use it for good. These are just a couple of examples on how you can empower existing technology to really become a changer and scale. And you are providing data and information that nobody has today because you're leveraging the existing through data, making some analysis and suggesting other where the need is. So you can also provide it to policymakers, as you suggested, very good suggestion about what's happening on the ground, on the field, in a country, in a region, and provide them on the fly by the time with timestamp of what's happening in that field and what people really need. Yeah, I can jump in as well. I mean, it, the point about uh, bias in, in job postings is something that we've actually been talking about internally. We, we over the last year, we launched a diversity, equity, inclusion committee, and a big part of the effort is looking at our hiring process. And, and a lot of it's just about education, right? And actually educating the people involved about what to do, what not to do. Um, and I think the, the point of, of using AI to identify some of the flags as a starting point, and certainly you'll want human review, uh, but it, it speaks really closely to what we do in general in our in, in captioning or subtitling the idea that we use some automation and then have human correction, human QA and things like that. And, and when we think about bringing people into our system and, and the labor pool, and we have a very similar model to what, to what Troy described, uh, this freelance kind of work at home uh, model, um, you have to figure out who's going to do well and who's not and try to identify that quickly, right? Because you don't want to waste their time. You don't want to waste your time um, out, of, out of fairness to everyone. Um, and so we think really carefully about how can you use technology to, to go through certain steps and provide certain types of feedback, you know, same idea as the, as the job posting and, and do certain types of scoring before you involve the human to do the review. Right. So we've built out a whole, we've actually patented our process, our, our onboarding process of bringing new people in and, and teaching them the system um, before. And they, they're going through many steps of, of learning how to use our system and 
uh, even get feedback before a human on our team gives additional feedback. And so finding ways of what, what can be automated, what can't, and being really realistic about that, I think is really important. So, you know, helping people understand you know, what can technology do and what are the limitations and then working with that, you can go really far, really fast. Yeah, I was going to add uh, as well. And I actually want to just briefly underline what Josh said. I mean, part of, uh, what we've developed over the last five years, what we had to be really good at is that screening process. Not everyone can do every job. And if you don't have that in mind, you, the results you get will be inferior. And you may assume that it's not working when in fact it's your screening process, the way you train. And relative to, to training, and, and I love this, the skilling at scale, it's my favorite term now. Um, here's just a practical thing that that we've seen, right? So again, we've, we've had millions of sessions between uh, people are blind, visually impaired, and, and agents, and many of that is in the context of work, and this last year has all been about retraining and overcoming or learning new tools, and I think the, the one thing that we've heard directly is that while I think a lot of well-intending corporations roll out what you would be a more traditional training, like a, you know, some kind of series, some kind of, you know, all day or, or, or even work, work from home and work through some content, it's really about the on demand as you need it model, which is, I don't know what I don't know. Let me progress. Let me, let me get into the content and then let me come back. And you need to think about different ways to deliver that. Of course, I was doing that, you know, that's the nature of what it is. It's 24 seven, it's on demand, it takes five seconds to connect to an agent. But if I were to think about the, the challenge more broadly, the more you can provide like on demand experts um, for whatever it is you need, um, and not just you know deliver that one-time content that gets 30% of the information across. Like think about other ways to support um, learning on the fly because that's the nature of what we're doing. Everything is so complex. There's no way to teach everything in in a more traditional manner. So I think it's about shifting our mindset about how to deliver that information. Great. I want to uh, give Allison some uh, last few minutes because <laughs> I know you actually are doing a lot of work at AARP. Please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, so there's sort of three points that I want to make if we're thinking about scale, because everything we do at ARP is about how do we make this big, right? How do we affect the most people, not just our members, but really everybody. I think one is the way that we're approaching this is really as an ecosystem issue, right? So we have to address consumers. We're doing a lot more in digital literacy, including with workforce training. Um, and in fact, we just announced this uh, earlier this week that we have acquired the Older Adults Technology Service as an affiliate for ours to really scale our ability to address older adults from a technology and digital literacy standpoint. We look at it, of course, from policy and advocacy. And I think there we're looking at how do we move from sort of our, our national nationwide state and government in the U.S. to how do we do this on a more global scale and are looking at our work with the U.N. on the social development goals and digital inclusion there. Um, and then how do we do this from an industry perspective? And so addressing this both with, um, we have a living, learning, and earning collaborative, living, learning, and earning longer collaborative um, that's really looking at workforce issues and then also working on this from a technology standpoint. And I should say that includes in my mind academia because if we're looking at scaling, a lot of what we're looking at is how do we get students earlier on to think about older adults across their career, right? But also if they're looking at developing solutions. So I think that piece is how ARP is doing it. The second piece that I wanna just briefly mention is we need better data. I mean, even when I was looking up the most recent OECD data, you know, the working age is 15 to 64. We're not even including things like older adults as part of working age definition. So I think there's a lot of work to be done on better data around the intersections of age and ability and technology that would actually facilitate. And, and I, that's hard data, but I also think soft data, right? What do users need? How do we immerse ourselves in more of um, uh, an, an empathetic uh, form of data with people who need sort of uh, differing kinds of uh, technology. Um, and I think the last piece that, that for me, when I think about scale is this broader issue of sort of ageism and, and that perspective, which is so pervasive. I um, mean, we've done a lot of work on this and I think we also have to change things like the perceptions that we're seeing about older adults or people with differing abilities in the media. So we know that, you know, older adults use technology all the time, but if you look at brand images, only 5% even show older adults with technology, right? Only 5% of images older adults have them with technology. And of those, they're almost exclusively of somebody younger helping them with technology. And so if that is what you are seeing every day in and out, 
even if you know you're sitting there with your smartphone or, or whatever else using it, what you're seeing reflected about your use and your years use in the workplace doesn't reflect that. We see similar issues with perceptions um, or, or the way that media is portraying older adults in the workplace. So I think those are, those are three really huge buckets, but those are all buckets that if we're really gonna change some of this, we kind of need to figure out how to address all of them. Yeah, I would just add one more uh, is on standards, right? Because we're talking about technology. Allison, you and I have some conversation in that area. So hopefully we can begin to blend the age and ability uh, standards together. Well, we are at the top of the hour. Thank you all very much. I think we can carry on this topic for another hour, two or three hours. Uh, thanks Zero Project for giving us the platform. Thank all the uh, pa panelists for coming so prepared and sharing your insight. And perhaps we can do this again uh, in not so distant future. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to a zero project.